So as I mentioned earlier, one of my judges, Sanjay Park, is also our keynote speaker of the day. Um, I would go into his background, but I think it is much better if you go to his site and check out his about section. And I, I have a feeling that a lot of people here are from Atlanta and involved with the Atlanta startup scene, so you will know of Sanjay or see him if you participate in more events such as these in the future. Um, personally, we are all very, very grateful that he is here. Um, he participates. He is the founder of Startup Riot, which I believe is in the spring, and you should definitely check that out. Oh, in February, and you should definitely check that out. If um, and competitors today, you should definitely sign up and try and go there. Um, but we really appreciate his time. He is a goes with a lung, and his spoken goes with a before. And join me in welcoming him. Uh, how's everybody doing? Yeah. Uh, so I did my little judging stuff, and then I thought, ah, you know, let me just come in here and talk, and while they do all that stuff out there, because that's a lot less interesting than, than being in here with y'all. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, kind of my experience being an entrepreneur, uh, doing startups, some of the things that I do now, some of the things that I've experienced, some of the things that I had happen to me um, when I was here at Guizueta. Um So first, I, I want to talk about a couple of uh, folks that we have here, uh, Coca-Cola. Kind of apropos uh, talking about it here. Does anybody remember when they were founded? 1886. 1886, correct. Does anybody know this logo? Let's see who's old and who's not here. Yeah, excuse me, modems. Modems. Uh, so Hayes, for you youngins that don't know, back in the day we had to use modems, and they would make this sound. Yeah, that sound. Um, Hayes was founded actually here in Atlanta. And they are like the standard bearer, or they were the standard bearer uh, when we had modems. Anybody know when they were founded? No, not 1886. <laughs> 1977. Um, and the interesting thing of the two is Coke is still around, Hayes, not so much. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background. Um, uh, as Ishan uh, mentioned, uh, I was a Guizueta alum. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But I was a founder of a company called Digital Envoy. Uh, I started the company in 1999. We ended up selling the company in 2007. Uh, I raised $12 million uh, lifetime for the company. Um, basically, what we did, have you ever been to the UPS website? Yeah. Yes. First thing they ask you is what country are you in? Or to IKEA? And the first thing they ask you is what country you're in? That is stupid, right? We don't walk into stores and have people ask us, what language are you going to use today and what currency are you going to use? That's just idiotic, right? So that evening when I hit those two websites, those two exact websites, I said, this is dumb and let me figure out a better way to deal with this. And what was interesting is I, was on a, I wasn't on a haze modem, but I was on a modem. And it was slow and it was painful. And this was a waste of my time. So. The technology I created was IP location. So knowing where somebody is on the internet, knowing only their IP address. Have you seen ads that are targeted you based on your location? Have you seen that online? Or the things like this where you have uh, things highlighted on the side um, based on your location? Well, if you've seen that, more than likely that's my technology. Um, here's the bad side. Have you tried to ever watch Netflix or Hulu outside of the US and you can't? Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> My fault. Kind of screws me up too. Um, that was not my intent. Uh, there's, I can tell you how to get around. I mean, if I don't stop, I know how to get So um, here's the thing that uh, in, in founding the company, it was me and two of my co-founders. Um, I'm very nicely labeled there, the tech nerd. Um, I ended up becoming the tech nerd slash business nerd. Um, my uh, lawyer co-founder was also a business guy as well, uh, and so the two of us uh, kind of managed all of this, uh, along with the guy, it's the finance dude, because neither the two of us really wanted to deal with the money, um, so we wanted somebody else to, to kind of handle all of that. But we had a big team, um, and we had a fun team, and a lot of what we did was focus on team and on culture. Uh, and what was interesting, actually, that happened just in here a little while ago, if you saw with the guys that were uh, singing a cappella, did you notice like a bunch of things about them, right? They were all 
dressed exactly the same. But more importantly than that, they were all really excited to be here. I think my favorite was the dude that was over here on the side, and he was playing like the bass or something like that, right? They were all really into it. And when they started clapping, they were all doing it at the exact same time. I mean, that is a team that was really meshed together well. So I think about teams and building these teams um, in the right way. Uh, I was a big fan of Xbox. If you were an Xbox Live player back in the day, you also interacted with my technology because they were actually one of our customers. So when you went online and your box had to find somebody else to play against, they used our technology to reduce the amount of people that you could potentially play with. One of the interesting things was, was when we signed them on as a client, we actually got them to give us free Xboxes. <laughs> so we had two in the office, and every day, I used to be a great Halo player, I kind of suck now, but every day we used to play four on four death matches. <laughs> and that sounds like it was something that would be a waste of time, but really what it did was it built a great team. We could have new people coming into our team, and they would get to understand how the team worked, and would get to enjoy time at work with their coworkers. So we had an incredibly low amount of churn because you don't want to leave your friends, right? And that's what we all became. We became friends, not just coworkers. So this is us uh, actually during one of our holiday parties, too. Um, and it was on a boat uh, up at Lake Lanier. Uh, brilliant thing, by the way, doing a holiday party on a boat, because you can't leave. <laughs> so no matter what happens, you can't leave. Um, and so that was the entire team at that point in time. The team actually ended up growing even further. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, my time here at Guzwet. I was here from 05 to 06 doing the one-year MBA. Do we have any one-year MBAs? None. <laughs> so disappointed. We had some. We did. They disappeared. They're here for one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, they know when I was speaking, I was a one-year MBA. Well, one of the biggest things that happened to me when I was, a, was an MBA student was uh, Leadership Academy. Anybody in Leadership Academy right now? Yeah? Um, it was a great experience for me. And a lot of times I will tell people that was actually worth the price of admission for me coming to Guizueta. We spent two days up at Quantico getting yelled at by Marines. That's me uh, with, my, with my fire team there. Um, and that's actually our gunnery sergeant that was, that was leading our small fire team, going through the leadership reaction course. We did things like this. <laughs> um, we did the full-on leadership reaction course and the obstacle course. That's Quigley. Uh, the thing that they tell you about the Quigley is, is that once you go into it, anything that you have that's white is going to be permanently stained. That is true. I still have my socks and underwear from back then, and it's still brown. Um, and they also tell you that three days, uh, for three days after you get out of the Quigley, that your skin is going to smell like the Quigley. And you're going to keep having mud and stuff come, that's true. I was having mud coming out of all different kinds of places. <laughs> but what was phenomenal about this experience was not just, I mean, clearly look at me. I am not in shape to be a Marine, clearly. I was in this shape uh, doing this as well. What was phenomenal to me was looking at the people that were Marines and kind of the pride that they had in what they were doing <coughs> and the team that they'd built and the, the kind of ethos that they built around that. At one point, actually on the Quigley, just as I was about to get in, the commanding officer who was I don't know, probably in his 60s, he was there just to you know make sure we were all going well. He jumped in and he did this thing. <laughs> There's really no reason that he needed to do it, but he did it because everybody else was doing it. And to me, that spoke volumes. So one of the things um, that I've been very fortunate to do is I've gotten to have a bunch of crazy experiences. Uh, and I make sure I take them whenever I can, because you learn a lot from, from these experiences. So I actually got to fly out and land on the deck of the USS Enterprise about two and a half years ago. Yeah, it was awesome, right? Jumping onto a Navy plane, flying out, and landing on the deck, getting tail hooked, and then getting catapulted off the next day. I was at one point about 100 feet away from jets taking off on the deck. It's awesome. <laughs> it is incredible. I mean, the largest US uh, aircraft, actually the largest aircraft carrier in the world uh, when it was operating, it actually is in the process of be being decommissioned right now. The, the place is massive, and it's incredible. But what's interesting is you've got 18-year-old kids um, 
running multi-million dollar pieces of equipment. So this kid, really is a kid, is running the catapult arresting gear. Um, so, or actually the arresting gear. So when planes are coming in, you know they have those cables and they have to tail up to those. So he's down below running all that gear. He's actually in charge. And so if he doesn't do his job, it's not just three or four or five million dollars worth of equipment that doesn't work. It's hundred million dollar planes that are going to go off the edge of the aircraft carrier and sink into the ocean. It's pretty important, right? But it's a big team and people expect that he's going to do his job and he knows how to do his job well. And he's going to do his job well. And you look at kind of the team that's running around and, and they told us all the colors and stuff and I've now forgotten all the colors, but yeah, these yellow shirts and the green shirts and the red shirts and they all have different jobs. And what's amazing is, is that they're getting these, again, $100 million planes and somehow all of these things are not colliding because, you know, talk about these aircraft carriers being big, this one being the largest in the world, they're not that big, right? <laughs> I mean, you've got planes taking off and going at high speeds. But miraculously, everything just works really well. Um, I've actually got all these, these photos and videos up on Flickr if you want to go look for them. The more amazing one is actually seeing jets taking off at night. It's totally dark. You see all these little dots walking around with all the reflective gear. And then all of a sudden, you see these afterburners turn on and these jets taking off. Uh, it is absolutely phenomenal. And again, it kind of comes back to the fact that they built a great team. So one of the things that I do is start up Riot. Um, you know, after I uh, exited from my company, I decided I wanted to give back. And I started up Startup Riot in 2008 as a way of doing that. We get 30 entrepreneurs up on stage to do three minute, four slide presentations all throughout the day. Uh, I'm very fortunate. There's a lot of people that come and uh, present. Uh, like I said, we get people from all over. We've had folks from as far away as Australia come and present at the event. We've had people as far away as the Ukraine fly in to attend the event. But I also get a lot of people that come and help me every single year and volunteer at the event. Uh, this event would absolutely not happen without these folks. And again, coming back to team, that's really why this event happens the way it does. We do it at the Tabernacle, if you know the Tabernacle here in town. It's a phenomenal venue. Um, I, I absolutely love it there. Next year will be our fourth year at the Tabernacle. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of folks there. Um, so I'm going to talk about Triplingo Jesse. I don't think he's in the room right now. Uh, we were actually just talking a little bit ago about what happens during these, these weekend events. Do these teams keep going on sometimes? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you about Triplingo. So Triplingo actually started up during a startup weekend event. So in 48 hours, they came up with a, well, Jesse really had the idea before. They built a prototype, they launched it, and they ended up winning startup, a startup weekend. Because they won Startup Weekend, and I think this was, Jesse will correct me, I think it was 2011, they ended up getting a slot to present at Startup Riot. And from getting that slot at Startup Riot, this is the team there, you see Jesse uh, right here. It's kind of blurry. These aren't my photos, these are their photos, so I had to take whatever they gave me. They ended up winning Startup Riot. This is them celebrating uh, singing karaoke afterwards. <laughs> so just think about that. So in a weekend, they came up, uh, Jesse had the idea before, they built a prototype, they went on, two weeks later, won Startup Riot, because they won Startup Riot, they got a slot to present at another conference. Those guys, honestly, um, so Jesse's not in the room, they keep freaking winning all the awards everywhere, left and right. If you look at their list of awards, I would kind of wish that they would just quit and let some other startups win some awards. Um, but they do a great job, uh, because they're passionate. Again comes back to the team that they built. And if you haven't seen the app, this is their app. Uh, it's really pretty straightforward and simple. Um, I like to talk about them a lot because I'll give you the disclaimer. I'm an investor actually in Triplingo as well. Uh, if you ever need to travel to another country and you don't speak the language there, you should pick up Triplingo. Uh, it'll give you the phrases that you need based on kind of your own personal needs. So if you have a peanut allergy or something like that, it'll give you the phrases that you need. And you've got a native speaker saying those phrases for you as well, uh, so that you can learn to say them yourself. Or really, if push comes to shove, you can just have the phone say it for you. So in all of this, I, I know I've been talking about team, but a lot of these things don't happen unless you're willing to fail. Right? When I started up Digital Envoy, my main kind of thought process was, even if I fail, I'm going to learn a lot. 
And that's exactly what I did. I did learn a lot. I ended up not failing. Which was, that was kind of fortunate and that was useful. Um, but I've always kind of tried to live by that. And so with that, you know, I've been fortunate. Uh, I've been lucky in terms of having a good team around me. Uh, and I've always kind of focused on that. Uh, but I've always been willing to embrace failure. So if, if anything that I can leave you with uh, from this weekend, you know, think about there's a lot of teams still in, here in the room. You don't know who's won and who hasn't won. Um, but it almost doesn't matter. Because you learned a lot, hopefully, I hope, over the weekend. Maybe you found some new people that you might want to work with. Maybe you found some people that you don't want to work with. And that happens too. Um, but that's a good thing to know. Uh, and keep taking those lessons forward because you're going to be able to apply those lessons kind of in the things that are going kind of forward for you. And make sure you don't forget that, you know, that, that was really the reason why you did this. It wasn't for the boy or anything else. It was to learn, to become better. Uh, and then, even if you didn't succeed this time, you will in the future. So with that, that's it. Um, it's a pretty free, straightforward talk. If you guys have questions, I'm happy to entertain anything and everything. Smartest when it came to all of that. Uh, so I graduated from Georgia Tech in '96, uh, electrical engineering. Um, Woo! Yeah, go Jackets. Uh, and honestly, I never did electrical engineering for a day in my life. Uh, what happens, right? Uh, I'd actually sworn that I was never going to do programming. Uh, I didn't want to be paid for staring at a screen, and sure enough, that's what I ended up doing. Um, so I was working uh, there, uh, doing systems engineering, working on cable quality stuff. And uh, this was during the dot-com bubble days, right? So anybody with an idea was going to get money thrown at them. That, that was kind of the modus operandi at that point. So I, I had been thinking about ideas. I was actually looking to leave my job uh, at the time that I came up with this idea, when I hit the UPS um, and the, uh, the IKEA website. And so talking with uh, these two folks that ended up becoming my co-founders, we started talking to some other um, angel investors, and we raised about $100,000 almost immediately. That is not normal nowadays. That you know, would never happen now. But uh, we did that. Uh, but that wasn't good enough to quit our jobs. That really just kind of got us going. And so for basically about nine months, I lived two jobs. Uh, so during the day, my company that uh, paid me a paycheck had my body. They might not have had my mind, but they had my body. Um, and during the evenings and weekends, it was all about coding, um, writing patent applications, writing prototype code, doing all that stuff. Um, to, at this point now, uh, I've got eight patents uh, issued to, my, to me in my name, another 10 outstanding. Um, the company has probably all told about 14, 15 patents. Um, so there's a handful that don't have my name on them either. So that really got us going. And, then, and the end of 99, beginning of 2000, we ended up raising a million and a half dollars. Um, I actually took a uh, trip to India at the end of 99 uh, for three weeks while we were fundraising. And that was my time to basically decide if I was going to come back and quit my job. And so the first working day of 2000, I went in and I quit my job. And I was the first employee of the company. Uh, my two other co-founders joined me about three or four months later. They were work waiting for a big uh, bonus payout um, from the company that we were at. Uh, I decided to jump and leave ship before that. Everybody thought I was crazy. Um, I probably thought I was crazy at that point, too. I mean, I left a good bit of money on the table there, but uh, in retrospect, it was the best choice. Um, not just because we were successful, but because, like I said, I learned a lot. And I think, you know, in a few years, I learned more than I could have anywhere else, uh, including coming to business school. So, uh, you know, not to say that business school isn't a good thing, but for me, it was good to come to business school and get my MBA after doing the startup. Go ahead. So what's the expectation now, for example, with Tripling Go, you know, all the awards they're winning, are the founders, have they quit their jobs, or when you start getting some kind of capital, is it expected that you quit your jobs, or what's the expectation now for that? Yeah, well, so if you're raising money and you aren't full-time, you're not going to get money. <laughs> That's all there is to it, right? Um, you need to have, you know, if I'm putting money into you, um, you've got to have as much skin in the game as I do, right? Because very likely my money is going to go to zero. Uh, and so if you're still doing the safe, the safe thing, like, I'm still going to keep my day job, um, you know, you, you're not really 
committed at that point, right? If you don't believe in you, why should I believe in you? Go ahead. I've got a ton of unparalleled questions, but you, I've got the impression you're a civilian. You made it to an aircraft carrier. How did you do that? <laughs> Um, yes, I am a civilian. Uh, I've never been in the armed forces. Um, uh, so how did I do that? Uh, I, part of, you know, all the stuff that I do, I really enjoy being in a room full of people that are not like me. Um, not to say that I don't enjoy this, but I like being in places where uh, I'm the aberration. So I have gotten involved in a bunch of organizations. So I'm a Marshall Fellow with the German Marshall Fund. Um, if you don't know that program, it is a great program. Uh, if you're an American, you get to travel in Europe for a month. The Europeans come to the U.S. for a month, uh, fully paid for by the German Marshall Fund. Um, yes, exactly. It's a great program. Mm -hmm. uh, alongside of that, that actually led me to become a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. If you don't know the Council on Foreign Relations, it is a uh, nonpartisan think tank, essentially, uh, based in New York and D.C. During the Council on Foreign Relations, we actually did a trip up to Norfolk Naval Base. Norfolk Naval Base is where the enterprise is, is uh, based. But more importantly, we met the, uh, the commanding officer of the naval base. And there was actually a program for US citizens to go on these embarks. Now, the problem is, is if you're just a regular person getting on the list of one of these, which you can do, it's going to be years before you get called for one of these things. Uh, because obviously, a lot of people want to go do it. There were about 12 or 14 people with me when I went on this trip. Um, so knowing the, the commanding officer, he put us at the top of the list. The problem with that trip is that they only call you about two weeks before. And so, you know, you know how life is. You can't, I, I got called probably a dozen times. And every single time I had to say no. But when it came up and it was the Enterprise, if you're a tech nerd, I mean, it's like, ah, it's the Enterprise. Come on, I got to go. So I got clearance from life and, you know, rearranged life and everything. And I was like, I'm going. Um, so that's how I got on. And it was a phenomenal experience. I mean, I learned a lot about just all the stuff that the Navy does. So, highly recommend it if you ever get it. The initial phase of your startup, how do you differentiate between, between co-founders and employees? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, so, how do you find the initial team? Let's tackle that first. Uh, you know, the initial team, I think, is the most critical. Um, up to about employee or person or founder or whatever you want to call it, number five, really kind of sets the culture and tone for your organization. If you screw up in those first five, you're not fixing it. Um, it's just not going to happen. I'll tell you a quick story. So back in the day when uh, we had to fly out to the West Coast a lot, um, back in the dot-com bubble days, it was probably, even with a month or a couple of months uh, notice, it was fourteen, sixteen hundred dollars $1,600 per ticket. Right? And even though we had a million, million and a half dollars, I'm a cheap guy. Uh, I don't like spending that kind of money. And so me and my co-founder actually had to go out, and we found a trick where you could drive to Birmingham one way from here, you'd fly back through Atlanta, and you'd save like five or six hundred dollars a ticket. So there were two of us going. That's like a thousand dollars or over a thousand dollars. That's worth a one-way rental car for us. So that's what we did. We hopped in a car, we drove one way to Birmingham. This was pre-9/11, and so on the way back, what you would do is you would carry on all your luggage, and then in Atlanta you'd get off and not fly to Birmingham and just throw away the rest of the ticket. So we did that, obviously, because it's our company and we would do that. One of my engineers then had to go out to the West Coast. Now, I wasn't going to tell him to do this. I had, nobody told him anything. He did the exact same thing. <laughs> Got a rental car by himself then, drove one way to Birmingham, did the whole thing, and saved us hundreds of dollars with no expectation that he was going to get a bonus or anything else like that. Right? The reason I tell you the story is, is that that act really kind of set the culture of the organization. Right? We showed that we were going to do whatever it took to be successful. We were going to save money whenever we could. And that kind of permeated throughout the organization. In terms of your question about co-founders versus employees, it's really tough. I mean, you know, really your first few are going to be co-founders. They're, they're going to be the ones that um, you really need on the team. You really need them committed. Uh, they're probably going to be the ones that uh, might not take a salary uh, for the first however much time. Um, that's really going to be the differentiation. When there was one point in time where we didn't have enough money to make payroll. And you have not lived until you can't make payroll. Um, that is really the kind of the mark of an entrepreneur. That, that's the difference between you know, the wannabes and the ones that are like, OK, I, I get it. right? So there was a point in time where the three of us co-founders, we all took live checks. Our checks didn't get direct deposited because we didn't have enough money in the bank to make payroll. 
Um, that, that's a very scary proposition, right? Because we had 10, 15 employees there. They were all dependent on us. Their mortgages, spouses, health care, and this, that, and the other. You made promises to these people. In the end, it ended up being totally fine. We got a $100,000 check from one of our clients that we were waiting on, so we were able to cover all the payroll. We were able to deposit our checks. But really, I think that's the big differentiation between a co-founder and an employee, right? The co-founder are, are the ones that are going to be like, yeah, let's, let's take live checks, and if, I don't, if I'm not able to deposit it, I'm not able to deposit it. Um, so in some ways, it's, it's a mentality more than anything else. Go ahead. Um, so, I, so you said that you're now invested in, um, in this startup that was uh, represented here by one of our Tripling up, yeah. Are you, represented, are, are you investing in more, and why do you, are you choosing to invest in other startups rather than tackle some other problem yourself? Uh, good question. Um, so I invest based on the people and the team. Um, there was another, and I didn't have it in this, this presentation, but... Um, there's another company here in town called Badgy. You know Badgy, any chance? Uh, they do um, Facebook optimization and social. They're, I think the tagline is SEO for social. And I've known the entrepreneur for over 10 years at this point. Uh, and he told me he was going to do this thing. And I told him right away, I was like, well, you know, tell me when you want me to write a check. And I'm, I'm, I'm in. Um, even though I didn't fully understand everything that he was going to do. I'm not a big Facebook guy. Uh, no. I'm a Twitter guy, I'm not a Facebook guy. Um, and kind of six, eight months after this, he was up in Indianapolis for the Super Bowl. And he was at the Shark Tank viewing party, and in strolls Mark Cuban. Everybody knows Mark Cuban, right? So this entrepreneur, Cole, unprepared, pitches Cuban. Pitches him the idea. It takes about eight months, but Cuban ends up becoming the lead. So I'm a, I'm a super tiny fish compared to Cuban. Right? Cuban led the deal, obviously. But that, I think, highlights the, the kind of entrepreneur that he is um, and that Jesse is as well. So I invest based on people. Uh, and <coughs> the reason is, is it's partly for you know, some of the things that you learn in school, right? You want to diversify your risk. So I am betting on people that may very well succeed. They might go to zero, too. But I'm betting on these folks that I know that if they go to zero, I know that they've tried their damnedest to make sure they wouldn't go to zero. Um, so for me, it's, it's really about that. And, and I was very fortunate. Uh, a lot of people invested in me and bet on me when they didn't know me at all. Uh, I was 25, 24 actually, when I came up with the idea for Digital Envoy. I turned 25 like a week later. Uh, and I had people investing in a 25-year-old, right? They didn't know what the hell I was going to do. Uh, and we were just kind of, trust me, it's going to work. <laughs> And so I feel like I, I have kind of a responsibility to make sure that others do the same, you know, or I do the same for others, just like I do with Startup Ride. So that's why. Good. How much? How much? Sorry. How much time do we have? I'll take this last question. Okay. Did all your funding come from Atlanta? And if not, in touch with the investors. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Um, so the question was, did all my funding come from Atlanta? And if not, how do we get um, our funding? So the, the angel investment, the million and a half that we did, was from all over. Um, the furthest away was Australia. And so it was all based on relationships. It was all based on um, people that we knew or people that they knew kind of down the line. Uh, the venture round, which is a little bit more interesting, which was $10.5 million, uh, we closed that in July 2001. And I pitched to a little over 200 VCs over 10 months to close that round. Let that sink in. 200 VCs over 10 months. And there's a little bit of backstory there, too. At the beginning of 2001, I had two term sheets. I signed one, and a month and a half into due diligence, the firm called us up and said, you know, we love you still. We haven't found anything wrong with you. We just don't have any money. <laughs> and that's kind of the most important part of the term sheet. You know, it's like the Seinfeld, the reservations. You don't know how to take the reservation. You don't know how to hold the reservation. You don't know how to write the term sheet. You just don't know how to have, you know, provide the money. Um, and so we actually had to start all over again. And in the end, it was the, probably the best thing that could have happened to us. Um, because originally we were looking for three to five million dollars. Our round went three to five, five to seven, seven to nine. We ended at ten and a half. Way more than what we were expecting. But in retrospect, 9-11 happened a few months later. Nobody here in Atlanta got funded for about a year. Had we not taken that money, we probably would have run out. We probably wouldn't have been able to raise another round. Um, so we were very lucky. But all of those folks 
were not here. There was one firm out of that ten and a half million that was based here. And the only reason that they were involved was AOL Time Warner Ventures was my main lead, my biggest investor, and they wanted to have somebody local. Other than that, we weren't really looking for somebody local. We weren't going to move either, but we weren't looking for anybody local. Okay, that's it for me. Thanks, y'all.